This is Julie Garden Robinson, and I'd like to welcome you to the Wednesday weekly webinar. And our guest presenter today is Todd Weinman. He's an extension agent in agriculture and natural resources, and he's located in Fargo in the Cass County Extension Service office. I want to remind you we have some upcoming webinars every Wednesday at this time through April 27th. Uh, please go ahead and sign up. Sign up if you haven't done so. I know I've been sending out a few direct links, but that way you will get the reminder notes and so on. Uh, next week, Tom Kelb will, will be joining us, and he will talk about 10 steps to a fantastic garden and also an introduction to square foot gardening. So that should be a very interesting session as well. Uh, just a couple logistics. Uh, everyone will be in the listening mode, but please go ahead and Type your questions in the chat pod. Um, that's right to the left of your screen. And I think most of you have found that. And Scott's sending us a little note, so check out what Scott is writing. At the end of the webinar, we will answer all the, or take all the questions and provide you with answers. And finally, I will have a short survey at the end of the webinar. And that links directly to an online survey. It will only take you a couple minutes, I promise. It's very short. But this project was funded by a grant, so you know, I'm asking you if you would please go ahead and fill that out, because I need to provide information back to the funder. And we will be continuing to add more resources to our brand new Field of Fork website. So keep checking that out. There will be all sorts of things that hopefully will help you, as well as links to entrepreneurial type resources. So again, we have Todd joining us. Um, his topic is using high tunnels to extend the growing season. And Todd is a horticulturalist in agri agriculture and natural resources. And he has a special interest in high tunnels. And I'm happy that Todd is joining us. So take it away, Todd. Thank you, Julie, for that nice introduction, and thank you, everyone, for coming. I know there's some other events going on at the same time today, but um, thank you for coming to this. Um, I'd also like to thank Terry Minich for a lot of the slides and um, help with putting this together. He's a University of Minnesota professor, um, quite excellent in high tunnels. Um, some of the high tunnel research sites in Minnesota, as we go through that, we really don't have a lot of them here in North Dakota. I know that um, I believe out in Botno and some here in Fargo a little bit, and there's also some people that are doing it privately for themselves, um, little CSA or consumer supported agriculture type operations. But as far as um, research, there really hasn't been a lot of it done here in North Dakota. And so I have a lot of information here from Minnesota where they've done quite a bit more of it. Um, what are high tunnels? A lot, a lot of times people will see a greenhouse or a high tunnel and think they're the same thing. They are not. And through this talk, I'm going to go through basically some of the differences and um, what makes one or the other. And as you go out into the, into the world, you'll, you'll notice that sometimes there's even combinations of the two. But um, usually one per, per, a person will be either one or the other. One thing with high tunnels is that they are um, somewhat of an intense growing um, type of an area. And people have gone up to three zones earlier or later and eliminate considerable risk. Here in North Dakota, we've gotten to a um, two weeks average in the, in the spring and two weeks in the fall. So basically, we have a, an extra month of growing on average, um, which is um, basically to say it's huge. Um, we can grow plants that we can't ordinarily grow, or we can get tomatoes harvested um, two weeks earlier than than we would have otherwise. And that's very important when you have a, have a business that relies on, on that. Um, they, they resemble greenhouses in appearance only. Um, a lot of times, people will have in a greenhouse, they'll have some other supplemental um, source of heat for, um, well, if it gets like a frost or what have you, or you just want to crank up the heat and have it go through all winter. Um, also, in, in high tunnels, there's no real fans or tubes or forced air. There are vents, and I'll have some pictures of those. And um, another big difference is the plants are grown in the ground. A lot of times in greenhouses, they'll be on racks or hanging from the ceiling um, in pots. But in a high tunnel, the plants are grown in the ground. One thing, and, and we'll get to some of the pictures later, um, some of the crops that, for example, right here, we're about to zone four. But um, you can grow zone five plants in 
in a high tunnel. And even some people have gone to zone six, but um, realistically, I would say another zone without any problem is, is something that, that easily can be achieved. Here retains heat. You get the heat um, a little bit earlier, and it also stops the wind, um, prevents some of the harsher weather from getting at your plants. Like I had talked to earlier, um, four to eight weeks earlier production in the spring. A lot of the producers that I've talked to have said um, for sure two weeks in the spring and two weeks later in the fall of growth. So in most cases, and there are exceptions of course, um, one month extra growth for your plants. Um, also there, there tends to be a higher yield per plant. There, there's somewhat more protected type of a situation. Um, it's cost effective, you're, you're in an area. It's very similar to some of the square foot tech um, ideology where you don't really need a lot of um, extra inputs because pretty much everything you're you're adding is 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 there. Also many people like to do organic production and this is a nice way of doing it. Um, natural disease control. You have a plastic barrier and, and, and it does open up of course but there is a there is a physical barrier that that is there for much of the time, and that does help with controlling a lot of windborne diseases, insects also. Um, you control your water, so if you put the water there, the plant will use it. Um, sometimes, if there's rows, um, there's a lot of waste with that, and and cull fruit is um, has been seen to be less with with high tunnels. There's a cost involved with it. Um, and it's and anyone who's doing high tunnel, I always say, try to find somebody that that has one. Talk to different people who have them up. Not everyone does it the same way, and there are things that you will like that other people do that um, you can use their ideas and such. This here is basically a pyramid of success or going towards success with a high tunnel. Um, you work with your soil. Your soil can be um, enhanced, improved inside of there. Um, some of the people will like to use little tractors and will show some pictures of that. Your irrigation is controlled, your variety is controlled. Everything basically is um, somewhat controlled or managed um, when, you're, when you're doing a high tunnel by the person that's doing it. You don't have a lot of outside influences on it. Um, harvesting the markets we can get to a little bit later on. Here's a really simple, easy, um, small high tunnel basically. So, some plastic pipe, PVC of some kind that's been in a, been in a U shape with some plastic over the top and, and boards holding it down. Um, extremely easy, very cheap, um, not one that I would prefer, but this would be um, a nice way to start if you had all basically no money and, and really wanted to get started with this. A little more advanced structures here, and you'll see a number, of, I've got a number of different pictures in here of different high tunnels. Um, and, and different structures with them. If you look on these, these have wooden ends, um, except for the very path, far back one, but um, the ends are made of wood. And with our climate here, it's extremely windy at times. If there isn't wood, many times the high tunnel will just be shredded or ripped right out. Um, it just can't handle it. You get a little bit fancier too. Here you, they, they've used um, aluminum um, for the support system on the inside, and they have a very nice framed and with a door for a person to walk in. And you also notice a lot of times when people do have high tunnels, they also grow plants outside of them. Here we have one that's been rolled up. Um, there are different types of um, motors and such for rolling up the sides. And you can also do it by hand or crank it by hand. I, would, I wouldn't recommend that. Um, if you want to crank it by hand, maybe talk to somebody who has one and ask them if you could come out and crank it for, by hand for a week for them. They'll be very happy and after the week you'll decide never to do it by hand. Um, get a little motor, it's, it's just the way to go. Here's another one. Um, you can see that it's cranked up part way. And if you notice too, it doesn't go all the way up. I'd say maybe four feet or so in a lot of cases um, is, is many times what the height will be. Um, this one also has a wooden barrier or a wooden wall on the on the side of the high tunnel. Like I said, there's a lot of different variations of this. Here's another one too. Just um, you can see that they have wooden ropes for um, basically somewhat somewhat of support. The strike ropes there are um, also good for that. Here, someone's getting kind of serious. They've got some um, one after another. It's, it's a nice business. One thing that you should keep in mind with this, everyone I've ever talked to has had these. Um, I said, how do you do financially with them? And 
it, it, it always ranges from we broke even to we made profit. Um, so far, I haven't come across anyone who's actually lost money on these, but you know, you'd hate to be the first one, and maybe they're not telling me the whole truth either, or not figuring in time, or what have you. But um, everyone that I've talked to has been um, fairly satisfied with putting up some type of a high tone. Here's another one, and and that's the thing too. If you're not very good with um, putting together things, like I'm not very good at putting together basically anything. Um, you can buy kits, and there's directions, and you can put it together from a kit. And so then it'll look really nice and square, and everything will be perfect looking um, for your high tunnel. Here's just an inside picture of it. Um, you notice that the sunlight's getting in there, and you can see that the wind would be stopped. The sides have been rolled up, and the door's um, on the far end there. One thing to really keep in mind with these is make sure that you've measured it so that you're, if you have a little tractor that you want to be working in there, um, before or after the growing season that it can physically get in. Nothing is worse um, than building one of these and then finding that you're about two inches too shy for getting a tractor into or out of it and um, now you've got to cut or move or try to shift or lift or um, take things apart to get the tractor in or out. Um, somewhat embarrassing and can be saved with um, simply shifting something over a little bit before um, you start building. If you look toward the top of this picture too, you can see that air vent right there is a wooden door. And so we're going to kind of see a lot of different types of um, air vents throughout this thing. Here's one that's not as rounded, more of a, a triangular type shape on the top. Another round one. And here on the outside you can see they've got plastic down and they're raising um, plants on the outside and the inside. And we'll kind of talk a little bit about um, the differences in, in yield and such for that later on. <coughs> now, when you when you have your your tunnel and it's ready to go, and you've got your soil in there and you've worked it up, um, you can take a look at it. You know, you might need to add a little more organic matter or some peat moss or what have you. And um, but it's something that you can do. You know, it's not an open field where you might waste some of it as you're adding it. Here you're adding it, and here it stays basically. Here's some more rustic ones. Um, this would probably be something like I would build. You know, where they um, they basically they got some plywood doors um, kind of held down with with some rope and such and um, and there's also um, not a lot of room for driving in there um, a little more rustic a little more frugal maybe in, in the building of this one or these two sometimes people add different amendments inside here they put some straw um, sometimes they like to grow strawberries in the straw and um, that'd be fine to do one thing to keep in mind with these though um, it's not recommended to have livestock and um, well, there's, a, there's a question if I could get to that later um, or maybe let me let me finish this first um, it's not a good idea to have livestock or cats or chickens or or birds or dogs in there a lot of a lot of concerns with um, animal waste when you do that and um, the waiting period for animal, for after your manure has been in there um, doesn't always correspond for when you want to harvest so and I have talked to people who've had um, pets in there or what have you, and um, it seems they've always had a great concern or fear that someone might get sick from their from their um, product. So it's best to keep them out, and, and it can be done. Um, I see there's a question here. It says, how high do the tunnels need to be to get enough area to dissipate the heat generated? Um, they don't always dissipate the heat generated, so you have to remember to roll up the sides, and, and we'll kind of hit on this later. If not, um, please come back if I don't answer your question. Here's another one, um, kind of a muddy area. If you look to the right, you can see that the soil has been pulled out of there. Maybe you can't, and um, they've made this so it has good drainage on the inside, but um, the outside of the tunnel is lower. Just another side view of one of the high tunnels. Here they've used wood, um, a wall on the outside, basically a wood wall, and, and that can be kind of nice too. Um, as far as cleanliness, I think it's, it's a nice way. Sometimes they just run the plastic to the ground. It seems to get into the dirt. But if you run your plastic right to a, a piece of wood, um, that seems to be a much more cleaner look to it. Here they're really fancy, and they have a door for walking in and a door for getting a small tractor in. Um, and like I said, if you're handy or, or if you have, um, you want to put it, you can tailor it the way you want. It's not you don't have to do it the way everyone else does. A little more fancy with the vents. Um, you can open up the vents on either end. Usually there's that, and sometimes right in the middle of the top of the arm center, but they'll have vents that you can open also. Just an inside view of the vent. Um, 
beautiful crops are grown in these. A lot of times there's just hardly any dirt splash up depending on who's watering for you, but the rain doesn't really have much of a factor with this. So you're controlling the water and um, nice clean produce is something that, that basically everybody likes when they when they have these. Um, he's not smoking a cigarette, it's a toothpick. A lot of everyone asks me, is that a cigarette? No, it's not. Um, and you can see the peppers are doing very nice inside. There are weeds on the outside, and that's something you should try to control so you don't start getting weed pressure on the inside. But um, everybody has their own philosophy or style. But um, those peppers are already standing right next to are just beautiful, and so are some of the other climbing um, cucumbers there. Here's some tomatoes just hanging in there. And um, a lot of times people will grow um, different types, um, maybe an indeterminate climbing vining type. Um, and there, there's a number of different varieties that a person can use that are better for high tunnels than, than for regular gardening. We touched on some of these things too, so hopefully um, it's not too boring, but um, or you fall asleep if I repeat anything, but um, I'm just emphasizing it basically. Um, good drain, raised soil. You don't want to have your high tunnel and after a good rain, you now you have enough water there to raise rice or maybe little ducks could come in and have a good time. You don't want that. You want it to actually drain away. Um, you want to be able to roll up the sides, and if you can't do that, you can have some really heat, a lot of heat issues, and your, your, everything can die in there. Um, so 6 mil ultraviolet treated plastic. Um, I know people that use that, or else they'll use um, a number of different variations of that. A lot of times it, it, it basically goes by um, you know, the cost at the time when they purchased it. Cold temperature, um, there, there's some information that will kind of tie in here in the, after the, in a little bit to the next following slides. Um, cold temperature in, in 2005 through 6, for example, they had 17 days where it was um, below zero degrees Fahrenheit, and their coldest day was minus 37 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, you know, and so it's like, and basically it's been getting cold, and um, obviously when it's really cold in the dead of winter, these high tunnels are not running, but they do have that extra week or two or three or four in the beginning or the end, and that does add up to um, longer growing season. And um, with that extra protection of the plastic, um, they have a have the fortunate opportunity that, um, for example, in these years when it was very cold, um, 2005 to th through six, even with the um, extreme cold on the outside of the tunnel, um, survival in the tunnel was 69 percent, 2 percent, 79 percent, depending on the year, and um, that that's huge compared to um, on the outside, which you know, um, here's an example of the Gothic tomatoes. Um, 94%, 92%, 95% had a survival rate inside the tunnel. Um, it makes a difference. Another nice thing too, a lot of people like to, to grow things that um, they ordinarily wouldn't grow outside here. They have some English cucumbers growing um, a trellis type system. And um, one thing nice about the, the cucumbers is that they, they're not on the ground and they're clean. You're growing them up and you're using a lot of um, vertical space that um, otherwise could be wasted outside. Oops. Here everyone does a little bit different. Um, here they've staked tomatoes and the tomatoes will climb up the stake and such. And um, just a very nice um, way to do it. Sometimes too, many times people will have plastic on the inside. They'll put it in the rows or they'll put it um, in the walk paths or what have you. And it all depends on personal preference. Some people enjoy plastic, some people do not. Here's an example of um, tomatoes that were started at the same time, same variety of tomato in the same place. Only one was in the high tunnel, one was not. Um, and if you look inside the high tunnel, the tomatoes obviously got ripe a lot sooner than the ones on the outside. And anyone who's sold vegetables before um, can tell you that if you have a two-week advantage on, for example, you bring ripe tomatoes to the farmer's market two weeks earlier than any of your competition, um, you demand the highest price. You, you're the one that everyone goes to. Everyone sees you as the person that knows what they're doing and provides good vegetables. Um, it's, it's, it's a big, de big deal to have your produce um, ripe when your competitors are not. Um, I think we've seen that picture already. And here's just um, a little bit later in the season. And if you look too on the left bottom, um, you can add different things in there. Um, sometimes people will put a little electricity or self-watering and such. Here's somebody using a digger or a ripper to, to dig into the soil a little bit and work it up. Um, these are the, a lot of things that are four things that um, work with the high tunnel um, principles for plant growth, time, heat, light, and stress. 
In the north, northern climates, um, the heat is, is probably one of our biggest concerns, and um, the seed catalogs are, are basically an average, or um, they, they talk about the best conditions. So if you order your seeds or your plants from a catalog and you get them and um, it's off a little bit, it's, it's well, two reasons. One, plants can't read, and the other one is is that um, it's, it's not exactly for the conditions. It's more of an average, just keep that in mind. Heat. Um, a lot of them have different growing degree days, um, and a lot of them have different temperatures they like. For example, tomatoes and peppers, 80 to 90 degrees, they, they like that. Cucumbers and melons, 85 to 95. And um, the temperature um, duration is, is, is critical for getting a harvest on a lot of these plants. A little bit on growing degree days, our units, I know a lot of you probably understand this, but um, just for those that maybe don't quite understand it, um, basically, Growing degree unit is class is is worked out for the high of the day. So let's say you had 86 degrees today and your low for the day is 50. Um, add those together, minus 15 divided by by two, and then you get your get your number for that. So you, you know, let's say you have a mid season tomato. Um, it'll require 1,400 growing degree days in late season, a little over 2,000, and uh, that can be a big difference. Um, for example, if, if you get a crop or not, let's say you want to grow a late season variety, but um, you're just not getting the growing degree days outside the high tunnel and the high tunnel, you more than likely would. Um, here's just an example of some different formulations on um, calculations on that. Here they did one um, where they compared the inside and outside of the tunnel. Um, inside the tunnel, you can see that with the formulations that we talked about, they were higher, you know, in March, 281 versus 5, and these are cumulative, so as these add up, the more they get, the sooner the, the vegetables will ripen, and um, on the right-hand side, you can see under the outside of the tunnel, you just aren't getting the same growing degree units as they are on the inside of the tunnel, and so you'll, you'll have a, a later harvest, if you get a harvest at all sometimes. Uh, this is a picture of Terry Ninich. Terry's been working with a high tunnel um, type work for 30 plus years, I believe it is, and um, and he's a great resource and a uh, great person to listen to, and um, I like listening to him when he talks about his high tunnel work and research. Uh, he had some nice pictures. Um, what's a what's, uh, presentation of beautiful pictures of fruit? Some of those English cucumbers, um, they look very clean, and look how clean they are. They're not on the ground. They're hanging up on trellises. They're grown inside these high tunnels. Um, they do very well. Here's another picture of some um, some of the growth of different plants that are growing in there during the season. Um, a lot of people like the high tunnels for a reason too as far as um, once they kind of have control over the weed pressure in there, um, it's fairly easy to control it. Um, they like it as a, as a basically an organic type of a situation. Here's um, an example too um, where they did a, their first high tunnel on July 10th. They had tomatoes um, harvested outside the high tunnel, August 11th. So a month later, so in this case, um, they had a whole month difference in the harvest of their tomatoes. Um, when you're doing this as a business, it, it's very important that you are earlier. And, and here's uh, an example of someone that was a month earlier, basically. Um, and a similar thing with the cucumbers. Um, we had the question about um, dissipating heat. Yes, they can get hot. They can get so hot that everything inside will actually die. Um, a lot of times people, um, you know, and, and that's where I would talk with other people before you start doing this as to proper timing of rolling up the, the sides. Sometimes if they're rolled up um, too early or too late, um, depending on how warm it is inside, um, you can lose heat that you need through the night or you can trap the heat in there and basically cook your plants. So it's um, it's a little bit trial and error, but what I would do is contact other people who have done it in the past and see what they what they say works for them for the crops that you want to grow. Um, not all the crops are the same, obviously, so you need to kind of do a little research on that. We control inside and out. A lot of times people say, well, I'm not going to control the weeds on the out outside. I'm just going kind to of control them on the inside. What happens is if there's any type of a root or um, or vining type weed that gets on the inside as soon as it starts to take over because you, you just somewhat ignore it. Or if it drops seeds and you have a, a giant seed bank on the outside of, of mil literally millions of, um, for example, lamb's quarter or what have you, um, that can be very difficult even though they're on the outside to keep them out. Um, monitor the water uptake. Um, you need to physically look at your plants. Um, a lot of times people have 
all drip irrigation and, and several different types of things, you still need to check it because there can be zones where the little piece of dirt or rock got in there and plugged it and now you have a zone that didn't get water for a week or so and you had a real problem. And then learning how to properly prune and trellis is important also. Here they, um, you know, the, there, there's also the, the, the thing with creatures and this would keep out rabbits and deer and such. But um, you know, you need to know your environment. If you've got a lot of jackrabbits and what have you, this would be this um, fencing would help with that tremendously. If you don't have anything like that, um, it's just an added expense. But if you have it, um, one day of um, wildlife getting in there can be a can be a whole whole season's worth of loss. This is an extremely important thing: um, narrow end against prevailing high winds. Um, if you put it perpendicular and, and not the narrow end against the high winds, what will happen is many times it will just um, catch on a, on a loose piece of plastic and basically rip your whole plastic or rip it right in half. And now you've got an interesting situation. Um, here it's very windy and so we, we keep that in mind whenever we do this. The outside air direction has little to do with the cooling, so even if you had doors and you open them up, it's not really going to get in there to cool it. You need to be able to open up the sides and also the roof vents um, at the appropriate times for dissipating the heat. Otherwise, you're going to you're going to cook your plants. Here they've got um, plastic and they've placed it down, and um, the the soil is is not the walking room, but the plastic is where the plants are, and the soil is the walking room. I'm sorry, and um, it's a very nice. Um, Nicely done, very neat. Um, whenever you do this type of thing, I know a lot of people say a crooked row, you get more vegetables, but um, sometimes it's hard to walk down a crooked row, and so um, a nice straight row like this is something to, to really consider. Here they've cut holes in the plastic and um, started placing their plants. And then there's always um, there's a lot of different um, research that has been done on the different types of plastic. I prefer like what they've done here with the black plastic um, for the best results I think but um there is um there are other people that say the the blue or the red and you know ha have better results and that's something that I, I don't know right now which is which would be better. Um, I'd have to do a lot more reading on that to, to make a decision. Um, I know that clear plastic is one that I, I wouldn't want to use. Um, clear plastic seems to be a, a you know where the black would be there. You'd have weeds growing underneath there. Seems to be a really good um, germinator of weeds and so um, I don't like the clear plastic for or plastic, unless you'd have to use it. If um, you could avoid it, that'd be the best. You can see it's a little bit further along. Um, they've got the, the plants are growing nicely now. It's been a little time has gone by, and they have all these little weird red hoop like things in there, and, and you'll see a little bit what they're doing with that. But um, this is something that, um, like, wow, this looks beautiful. I love this. So they're they're doing a nice job here. Now inside their high tunnel, they've actually put low tunnels um, to even further along. Say you had a, a spring that was really cold and you wanted to trap the heat a little bit more or you wanted to get airflow with your plants. Um, the low tunnels uh, many times are a type of a fabric that the air and even moisture can get through and so it um, has good airflow and it helps with the plants. It's a nice white color. If it's um, absorbing light, pushing it through. Um, just another little trick to do it. Not necessarily always needs to be done, but um, Every little bit helps whenever you're whenever you're working with this type of thing. And you see further on, um, everything looks fantastic. Um, you know they've got the the cucumbers growing high up right into the roof. The tomatoes on the left are doing very nicely. Um, you, you tend to get a larger yield with with high tunnels. Um, it's a, you know three to four times the yield can be up over what's done in the field, um, and and that's that's very very important. Another thing I didn't talk about, but um, I'd like to at a different time, or, or you can look it up yourself, is um, many times a person will need some type of pollinator inside there, and you can purchase bumblebee packages. So I just want to throw that out as an aside. Um, you can order bumblebee packages for for your your high tunnels um, just for pollination. Um, one thing with higher yields, though, you will need more nutrients, and that's something that you you need to just basically play around with and, and try. You don't want to do too much. Too much for um, nitrogen and fertilizer and other things like that um, will actually cause um, your plants to burn or die. So you need to basically try things, and um, it, it's best to do less and then add more as time goes on um, versus the other way. Because once your plant is dead, you need to start over um, versus not. I, I just love this picture. 
Um, when I see this, I just get hungry. Um, you know, just some, some vegetables they've grown in there. The other thing, just a little hint for people that are growing or using these for for profit, is that you might like to grow banana peppers, but if no one in your market likes to eat them and they like to eat um, ghost peppers, for example, instead, well then you probably need to grow ghost peppers. And so um, this little thing, um, know your market whenever you're growing your vegetables. But I just love this picture. And wow, look at that. The raspberries there are fantastic. Um, and people say, well, why would you grow raspberries in a, in a high tunnel? You know, they're doing fine outside. Uh, you, you could get um, varieties that are a little less um, hardy for here. For example, um, there's a variety, a yellow variety of raspberry called Anne that um, sometimes you get a crop, sometimes you don't, depending on the fall when the frost is. Now, two weeks more protection of um, warmth inside there and maybe even more um, because of uh, the, if you had it sealed up so that the frost couldn't get in at all, um, you would definitely get a, a crop of yellow raspberries versus the ones on the outside. It would be hit or miss and you might get one every four or five years a crop. So um, definitely something to consider. Um, different varieties and length the growing season is improved. Well, here they've, they've got some straw for strawberries um, just to keep them nice and clean. Um, not a bad idea. One thing to keep in mind though, whenever you have straw like that too, you can get rodents. So you want some type of a rodent control. And, um, and I don't mean cats. Um, you don't want cats in there. Um, here's just a little um, sign that they have up for um, their high tunnel research projects in Minnesota. And here's one of the roof vents I was talking about. And this is something that you would um, want to definitely open. For example, if it, get, if it gets too hot, um, and that's what the problem is with a lot of these, is that they get too hot. And to cool them down, you might have to somehow open that up if it's too hot inside. Obviously, open it from the outside with a pole or what have you, but um, or even have it open earlier. And that's something, whatever you, the way you build your high tunnel um, and tailor it to your own needs, is um, you'll start to figure out how to do that as time goes on. Um, one thing I want to emphasize is that none of these things are, you know, just because four people did it um, doesn't mean the fifth person is going to do it the same way and they, they'll have different situations, different problems, and different um, circumstances as far as controlling things in there in everybody's high tunnel. Here's a um, website that's um, very good. Um, I, I, I look at this site every once in a while. I wish that was mine, but it isn't. Um, University of Minnesota, very nice high tunnel workshop, or um, not workshop, website. Um, I, and now, I, if there are questions, um, um, you, if you could ask, I know there was some earlier, but um, I'm not able to really uh, do more than two things at once, and sometimes I have to stop to actually breathe. So um, if, um, let's see, let's see if I can go back to this. How do the high tones need, how high do the high tones need to be to get enough area to dissipate the heat generated? Um, many times the high tones I've seen, the ones I've seen are, well, and you saw some of the earlier ones too, where they're about nine feet tall, but um, they've got some here that are 20 plus feet. Um, I would say that's a little bit extreme, but depending on the size of it. So that's how high does it need? I don't know if that's um, something I can actually answer with um, a straight question versus um, I think it's more like um, how knowledgeable do you need to be when you're doing this so that you can um, control the heat by opening up the sides and also the, the top. When do people usually start planting in high tunnels in our area? In, in this area here, a lot of times um, you can go ahead and plant a couple weeks, at least two or three weeks ahead of time. Um, so let's see here, that doesn't really help for an exact date. But I would say um, May maybe um, would be um, a very close possibility sometime in late May. Um, and many times it can't be exact either because um, you can have extreme weather situations where it's um, it's beautiful outside or it's it's so cold that nothing can survive. Um, so you have to kind of play it by ear. But in general, um, two weeks or three weeks earlier than, than people would be planting outside. Let's see, if you're a master gardener, the survey link also will take you to a place where you can print a certificate for continuing education credit. Okay, um, I guess that's more of a statement, not a. Um, not a question. Is there any other questions? Uh, there, there's so much on um, this type of topic, and, and a lot of people like to go down different avenues with it. Um, the biggest thing I can say with it is, is that go to a number of different trainings on it. And um, are there extension publications, Todd? Um, I do not have any for NDSU, but I know that the University of Minnesota 
has some actual PowerPoints on their, their websites for high tunnels. And they have some other um, just basically data sheets on varieties and um, old plans for high tunnels and such. Um, I, my understanding is that Botno has information on it, but I, I haven't seen any of that. But I know that the University of Minnesota has um, has a tremendous amount. And also, um, Bob Ninich is um, very easy to approach if you email him. He's easy to get a hold of. Um, calling a little bit hard to get a hold of him, but um, if you say, and if you look on his, I'm just typing University of Minnesota, um, not Bob, but um, Terry Ninich, um, he'll pop up and just send him an email, and he can refer you or talk to you directly about um, exactly what you're looking for as far as varieties or, or, or design or um, fertilizer and such for that. Anyone I think a couple people are typing questions. Question? Oh. Let me turn this down. I think I about popped off my ears with that a little bit. Okay. I'll wait for that then. The answer to Cecilia's question is yes, these are being recorded. And we will post the archives for the series a little bit down the road. <laughs> no no cost. Four dollars. Does anyone else have any questions for Todd? I've been doing this, um, uh, uh, putting on a high tunnel type workshop and um, for about maybe six, seven years now. And every year um, I'm learning more and more about it. Uh, well, I've had Terry as a, a speaker for the last five um, years on a number of different topics. It's been very, very good. Um, but like I said, there's um, I mean, you could spend whole days on this topic and um, and go from there. But um, every, the biggest thing is um, doing it and um, and trying it and then keeping in mind that yours is not going to be like um, many other people's as far as your environment's different, you're growing different things, and just a number of different um, situations that um, you're going to be different. Also, uh, um, another thing before I forget, you can check with your, um, I believe it's um, EQIP program, E-Q-I-P. I know that at one time they did a cost share with these, so if you're planning on doing this either way, or even if you aren't, um, check with and see if there's any money left with EQIP, EQIP program, um, with your, um, I believe, you know, Soil Conservation District slash NRCS would have, more than likely NRCS would have um, information on that, and um, it's a nice nice thing to have, um, I, if I'm not mistaken, it was up to 40%, maybe a little more of it paid for, and um, that's just savings right there, so something to really think about. Check with your local one in your county, though. And answering Jeannie's question, I really answer, want yes, we will, um, we will put these online. I haven't put them online yet because we're trying to run them live first few weeks. And if you can't sleep, this will be a good way to, just listening to my voice, just don't do it while you're driving. Um, if you can't sleep, just listening to me talk will knock you right out. Just ask my wife. She can fall asleep as soon as I start talking about work. <laughs> she's just out. So this will be a, kind of a nice organic sleep remedy right here. Todd's a joker, as you can see. All right. Let me see if there's any more questions. Um, just one more reminder, if you wouldn't mind filling out the survey, please do so. Those are really important to us. And then join us again next week. I saw Tom Kalb was one of the audience members today, so he will be our speaker, and he's located out in Bismarck as a horticulture specialist. So any, um, do I need to print out the certificate to get credit for the continuing ed? Todd, you're a master gardener person. <laughs> I, it would give you proof, but I, I think all you'd have out. to do is write it down. Print it out? Okay. I'm pretty relaxed, but you might as well print it out and then you can just show me. Look how great I am. And then I'll look at it later. Well, thank you for coming, um, and um, we'll go from there. Thank you very much. <laughs>